this is lecture 10F on polar curves. When you have a polar equation and you want to draw the accompanying curve, there's several ways to do it. The first is, I'm going to call it brute force, just make a list of points, r theta, r theta, r theta, and plot them on polar graph paper. Okay. The second way I call refined brute force that actually gives you a little bit of insight, and that is to generate a rectangular plot of r versus theta, and then read the points off the graph and plot them, again, on polar graph paper. This gives you an idea of periodicity, if there is any, and it also um, helps you, I don't know, gives you a better look at the curve. So those are two ways, kind of the order of just using the points. Then there's two other methods, and one uh, is to convert the polar equation to Cartesian equation. As mentioned before, for parametric equations in general, sometimes the Cartesian form of the polar equation does not give any insight and, in fact, might be very difficult to obtain. Occasionally there are exceptions, though. For one particular equation, the Cartesian, uh, for one particular polar equation, the Cartesian equation uh, gives quite a bit of insight, and we're going to look at this polar equation right here, r equals 2a, where a is some constant, times the sine of theta. All right. It's going to take several steps to the, get to the Cartesian equation, though. So first we look at the definitions of the uh, correspondence between the Cartesian xy coordinates and the r theta coordinates, and that's given right here. And the important one for this particular equation is y. y equals r sine theta, so we can isolate the sine of theta and substitute this with the sine isolated into this polar equation. And the result is um, r squared equals 2 a times y. Well, we're halfway there. We no longer have a theta, but we still have an r. So at this point, we can use the Pythagorean theorem, r squared equals x squared plus y squared, substituting x squared plus y squared for r. We now have an equation with no r and no theta, just x's and y's. In the next step, we complete the square on y, and we complete the square on y here is the result. a squared equals x squared plus y minus a squared. This is a circle of radius a centered at the point x equals 0 and y equals a. Polar equations of, of the form that we saw before trace out circles. Here are the typical equations. a equals plus or minus 2a times the sine of theta. This is a circle of radius a. The center is at x equals 0, y equals plus or minus a. Here I'm showing a minus sign in this equation. On the previous slide, it was plus. Okay. And here's another form. r equals plus or minus 2a times the cosine of theta. This is another circle of radius a, and its center is the plus or minus should be inside of the parentheses. Like that. Okay, plus or minus a. x equals plus a or minus a, and y equals zero. Remember, the Cartesian uh, equation really doesn't give the time history of this curve. Uh, when you just look at it, you can't tell how it was traversed. However, if you uh, if you pay attention to the r and theta uh, form, you can draw some arrows on the curve and show it. And I'll have um, an example of that in a few slides. And what I showed in that third method of drawing polar curves actually leads to a very helpful and insightful method, which I'm calling method number four, and that is to look at the polar equation and see if it corresponds to one of the classical polar equation forms. And there are several of these. You might have seen these in trig. These polar curves are grouped into families. The families are roses, circles, lemniscates, lemison, and spirals. Those are the famous ones. And you can make a correspondence between those forms. You can draw the curve very easily, or at least you can get insight into what that curve will look like. So just to summarize on some of these forms, these classical forms, looking again at circles, here are circles of radius of radii a, and they have the form that we had uh, two slides ago. r equals plus or minus 2a times the cosine of theta, and r equals plus or minus 2a times the sine of theta. So, for example, if your polar equation looks like this, r equals 42 times the sine of theta, right? This is a circle 
of radius 21. Remember, it's 2a, so it's 21 is a radius. And it's centered at 0, x equals 0, y equals 21. Just for completeness, I want to write here, just so that you have it, um, the general expression, polar expression for a circle centered not just at a different radius, which is what these are. These are centered at some different radii, but they're located, depending on the sine or cosine, they're located either on the x-axis or the y-axis. So in these cases, theta is either um, 0 or it's um, 90 degrees, pi over 2. But the center could, the circle could be centered at any angle. And here is a general expression for that, a little more complicated than those forms. It reduces to those forms when theta is 0, uh, theta naught is 0, or theta naught is um, pi over 2. An equation looks like this, r squared minus 2r times r naught, r naught being the center, times the cosine of theta minus theta naught plus r naught squared equals a squared. So it's a little more complicated. But again, if you have an equation that looks like this, you can make a correspondence between the different terms. This is a circle. It has, okay, the a squared is out here, is now 9, so it has a radius of 3. It's centered at, I should have said r naught, theta naught here, but it would be centered at um, x equals 0, I'm sorry, r equals 6 and theta equals 0, so in a sense r equal, um, x equals 6. Okay, so those are circles. Now we'll look at roses. And here we have just a, well it looks like a small change in that formula, and I'm going to list all these formulas together um, at the end of this lecture. So you can just see this contrast. So uh, before we wrote this as r equals 2a times the sine of theta, now we have the sine of n theta, where n is not necessarily an integer, but for now, for describing the rows, is the way we used to look at them, n is an integer. Okay. See, this form is just slightly different. Instead of just the sine of theta or the cosine of theta, we now have the sine of n times theta. Okay. Now, if n is integer, here's the kind of um, here's the kind of graph we get. And those are called whoops, didn't get the pen. This is the sort of graph we get, and those are called roses. And each one of these circles here, or all these, uh, are called leaves or sometimes they're called petals. And there's an inter interesting result. If n is integer and it's odd, then the rose has n petals. So if n is 3, it has 3 petals. If n is 5, it has 5 petals. But in, if n is it even, then the rose has 2 n petals. So if n is 6, the rose will have 12 petals. If n is rational but not integer, then the petals will start to overlap, and you get more interesting uh, pictures. In, but in general, uh, these all fall into one family of curves. So I'm going to use that other method I talked about right now uh, where I said you could, uh, to plot this graph, you could make a rectangular graph of r versus theta and then pull off the points. So here we're looking at r equals, I guess about 3, times, and this is the sine of 2 theta. And here you can see if I plot r versus theta, this is r and, and this plot right here. I'm going to get a pen. So this plot right here is r versus theta. It starts out here at cosine, of course, at a. And because it's 2 theta, it has periodicity of pi. And then here's two cycles of it. I'm going to trace, make a correspondence between these cycles and the curve as it's drawn. So this is one right here, okay? So you start here at a, and then you, and then a is decreasing. So we're starting right here, theta equals zero. We start at this point. All right. Now, theta is increasing. It's going from zero to pi over four, but the radius is decreasing. And you see, we trace out this. The radius is decreasing, and in fact, it gets to a zero radius right here at pi over four. But that pulls that in to pi over 4 minus as a combination. Okay, here's pi over 4 right here, and now you're at the radius of 0. And now you go for negative values of radius, but you know how to handle that. You um, find the plot, find the angle, and then go to the other side. So you would find this angle over here, but then you would move 180 when you have a negative radius in a polar equation or polar coordinates. And so now this is number 2. It's traced out here. So here was 1. 
here was 2. Now we continue tracing, we come back to 0, which is this point right here. Right. Now we go to 4. So we're over in this part of the graph, we're over here. Theta is increasing and r is also increasing, and we trace out 4. Then we go, and now of course here's 5, 6 loops this way, and 7 down here like that. So then you complete it back up to 0. Theta equals 0, or 2 pi, and the radius is a. Well, that's, those are roses. Here are the lemniscates. This is a Latin word meaning hanging ribbon. It does sort of look like a ribbon people put on presents. And the form of the equation for these hanging ribbons is r squared equals a squared times the sine of 2 theta. So the change here from the previous slide, a of course, a squared versus a, I mean, you can handle that because that's just a constant, but the r is squared. Okay. And there's a difference whether it's sine or cosine, and we've seen that before with the circles that we're just moving those circles around in the plane about about the polar axis. Lemisson, this is another family of curves. The polar curves, it's a French word for snail. And here is the form of the equation. R equals a plus or minus b times either the cosine of theta or the sine of theta. And these Lemisson look like this. I guess they kind of look like snails. And there's certain characteristics of the um, of their shape depending on the values, the relative values of A and B. If A is less than B, then it has this loop here. Now if A is B, you get a cardioid shape. Remember we had a cardioid shape also when we just were looking at parametric equations in general. And the cardioid in a construction, um, a geometric construction, was the epicycloid. All right. This one's called a dimple, and then of course it only gets more. So these are your Lemisson, and you can see the form there. And now I want to put all these together just so you can see the progression, because that's probably the most important point here. Here's the equations for the circle. R equals plus or minus 2a cosine theta or sine theta. For rows, r equals a times the sine of n theta. Remember, if n is an integer and is even, then the rows has two n petals. If n is integer and odd, the rows has n petals. Okay. And your lemniscates, which are hanging ribbons, now have an r squared term. r squared equals a squared times the sine of 2 theta. It's your form for your lemniscates and your lemison, your snails. r equals a plus or minus b times the cosine of theta looks fairly similar to a circle, but the additional constant a makes all the difference. Now the other uh, group we're going to look at are lines. The polar equation for a line is not very straightforward. Um, the polar equation for a circle is very easy. Remember if you have a circle of radius a centered about the origin, then the polar equation is r equals a. The polar equations are more set up for circles than they are for lines. One way to um, represent a line in polar coordinates is just to give the angle as a fixed value. So if you have a fixed angle, and then theta equals the arctangent of m, m being the, um, the slope of the line that you want, theta equals the arctangent of m. So theta is a constant, meaning all values of r are acceptable. So if you plot this, and get the pin, sorry. So here's um, here's a polar graph paper. All right. And so you have theta is fixed. Say so theta is equal to, I'll just say pi over 6, which is about here. Um, then the line means that theta is fixed and all values of r are acceptable. And so that would be your line pretty bad line, but that's the idea, that the angle is fixed. Right. In this case, you would know um, this is the general form. 
if you happen to know the slope of the line that you want to represent, but if you just want, whoa, that was supposed to be a marker, but it was not. A equals theta, I mean theta equals A, theta's constant is in a line. So, let me try to write on this here. So here's our circle. Hmm. Okay, so R equals A, and then for a line, theta equals A. Every time I think I have my problem solved with these pins, these writing tablets, I seem to not have it solved. I get in the middle of the lecture, so I apologize for that. So the line, I'll say it in words, the line is theta equal constant. The circle, R equals constant. And that would be a line going through the origin or a circle going through the origin. It's a more complicated expression if you want an arbitrary line. Um, go back to the, um, using the mouse. If you want an arbitrary line that doesn't necessarily go through the origin, and here is here's a form for that. R equals R naught times a secant of theta minus theta naught. This line goes to the point R naught theta naught, and it is perpendicular to another line that goes to this point R naught theta naught, and also through the origin. So again, polar equations were not written, and polar coordinates are not necessarily written for lines. So this is the end of the introduction for polar curves, for the sort of families of polar curves, excluding the spirals. In the next lecture, I'll talk about spirals.